Um, how many, I want to ask, how many of you, raise your hand if you participated or uh, joined some of the earlier sessions uh, today? Did you? Okay, so most of you, all, all, all except for uh, Julius. Okay, great. I couldn't join too. Uh, okay, okay. Well, this session today is uh, the roadmap for India's transition. And it's meant to be a summary uh, session, kind of wrapping up and looking back at the topics that have been discussed for today, um, pretty much all day. I mean, Frank started his day at four o'clock this morning here in Zurich to be able to dial in and he's still going and I don't know when he's gonna end, but if you've been to his other harasses events, you know that they go well past midnight and they start at 6.30 the next morning. So harasses is not a place to, to catch up on your sleep. Um, so I made a couple of notes. I so sat in I, on a number. Of, I sat in on a number of the sessions today, and I thought I would just quickly recap a few of the highlight items for those of you who were in or uh, those that were not in. And then I'd like to come back to what we talked about uh, at our uh, rehears rehearsal, which is for each of us to introduce ourselves. Hello, hello, uh, welcome. Okay. Glad Hello. to join. Hi, Chef. Hi. Hi, Chef. So uh, I will uh, sort of recap a few of the highlight items that were discussed during the day. And we should keep those in mind as we make our remarks uh, in this session about the roadmap for India's transition in light of the comments and the concerns that were brought up uh, earlier in the day. So some of those, uh, obviously, are the highlights that we all know about, the economic slowdown that's been happening right well, well before uh, COVID, and then obviously leading into COVID, which is having a devastating effect on all countries, some more than others. India has been managing better than others, but there's still concern about how it's going to impact uh, India. The other major topic was uh, the US, the mess in the US and more generally the lack of leadership uh, in the world. We're, we're sort of, I think we all have a feeling that we're, we're coming to the end of an era, which I might call the, uh, the post World War II order, world order. And we're entering some sort of a new order where China is emerging, Europe is not quite sure where to go. The Europe, the US is imploding. We have, a, we have a technology washing over every single person from the farmer to the factory worker to the chief executive of a, of a company and trying to figure out how to navigate when there's competition and there's, uh, and there's change is coming at a more accelerating pace. Uh, another major comment uh, concern was climate change. And the fact that that used to be six months ago, one of the most important topics we're talking about, every World Economic Forum session was all about climate change. Suddenly that's been that's off the front page. Now COVID is on the front page. Climate change is still there. Um, another major topic is uh, the geopolitical world we live in and the trade wars and the need to be able to bring um, solutions to a, a lost world. So the, the topics go on and on, um, you know, the rise of China, nationalism, um, the need for energy, uh, energy solutions, because the carbon era is coming to an end as well, maybe not in our lifetimes, but the beginning of the end is in our lifetimes. So we've got a lot of there's very serious uh, issues that are impacting all of us. Education is another big one. So I'd like to switch now. Those are sort of main global conversation, you know, global agenda items that were brought up during the course of the whole day today. And I'd like to just switch over to ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Who are you? Where are you? What's your role? Who's your company? And what perch do you sit on on the tree? Are you in uh, government, academia, business? And what's your sort of passion and your wish? And then from there, when we finish up with the last person, we'll get into a more... Uh, uh, open discussion. So first of all, Sam, uh, can you introduce yourself, please? And uh, yeah. go So firstly, big thank you to Dr. Frank Richter for getting us all together on this platform. So my name is Colonel mm -hmm. S.M. Kumar and Sam to my friends. And I'm the co-founder of Midcat Advisory. 
and India and Singapore based risk consultancy. Geopolitics, national security, and entrepreneurship are my areas of interest, and I'll briefly touch upon these. John, do you want me to take up my point now only? Introductory yeah. remarks? Yeah, now. Okay. Yeah. So, so let me start with a first a peep into India's history. Uh, if we look at from 3500 BC to 1700 AD, uh, that is almost for 5200 years, India was a quarter of the global GDP and one of the two eminent global powers, and most of the time, top global power. So 300 years is a very small time in the history of a nation. Uh, we missed industrial revolution completely and few other revolutions partly. Now the digital revolution, the flattening of the world, the diaspora, India's entrepreneurial spirit, and the shifting sands of geopolitics. All these provide us a great opportunity to reclaim our lost glory. Uh, this century, as the, geos, as the global center of gravity shifts, to Asia, and the first quarter of the century belong to China. I think the second quarter will belong to India. A secure and stable environment, both external and internal, will be essential for India's growth. And for India, challenges abound on her periphery, be it in the Indo-Pacific or land boundaries with China or Pakistan. The recent border face-offs and the escalating threat environment must lend greater urgency to defense modernization indigenization and achieving self-sufficiency in critical technologies, cyber threats, both from adversarial state actors as well as from cyber criminals are rising. And we must continue to invest in Intel and cybersecurity platforms to secure our critical national information infrastructure. Space is another domain and Julius is here. I'm sure he'll talk more about that. We must build on our progress and early successes in space. We must strengthen other elements of comprehensive national power. And the first one that comes to my mind is diplomacy. We must build up the capacity of our foreign service and diplomatic missions and give them more strategic and economic firepower. We must continue to invest in relationships with neighbors, like-minded global powers, and strengthen global efforts to counter terrorism. So boosting innovation and enterprise would be the key to India's rise. India has the third largest entrepreneurial ecosystem. World's largest IT companies are being run by Indians, Global, Microsoft, Adobe. So government, industry, academia, collaboration, that would be the linchpin of success. We must invest in R&D. We must invest in enabling ecosystem, including the Angel VCP ecosystem. I'm sure Nathan will cover that. India can easily become a global leader in IT, cybersecurity, pharma, services, and social innovations. Finally, India's freedom, democracy, and soft power. And as I travel all around the world, I realize that India's freedom, democracy, and soft power is India's biggest strength. We must nurture our freedom and democracy at all costs. So thank you. Back to you, John. Wow. What a, what a mouthful. That, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. That is great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, that's hard to follow, but Manoj, can you uh, can you go next and uh, add add to what uh, add to what Sam said? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank thank you, all. thank you, John. Uh, just to give you a brief background, my company Prime Urban Development India Limited, which I spearhead as a vice chairman, is a private sector enterprise in affordable housing and in land development in South India, in Coimbatore, Tirpur, and Kodagiri. We are also in exports of textiles. Uh, as vice chairman of the Cotton Textile Export Promotion Council, the Textprocil, uh, we represent $13 billion uh, worth of export of raw cotton, yarns, fabrics, home textiles from India. At Textprocil, uh, many of the companies represent the MSME sector in India. Now, on the MSME sector, the Indian MSME sector is the backbone of the national economic structure and has unremittingly helped the Indian economy to offer resilience to global trade shocks and advertisements. With around 63.4 million units throughout the geographical expanse of the country, MSME contribute about 6% of the manufacturing GDP and 25% of the GDP from service act activities, as well as 33% of India's manufacturing output. They have been able to provide employment to about 120 million people and contribute around 45% of the overall exports from India. The sector provides a wide range of service and is engaged in manufacturing over 6,000 products, ranging from traditional to high-tech items. <coughs> the sector has consistently maintained a growth rate of over 
about 20% of the msmes are based out of rural areas which indicate the deployment of significant rural workforce in the msme sector and shows the importance of this enterprise in promoting sustainable and inclusive development as well as generating large scale employment especially in the rural areas given the contribution to the indian manufacturing sector and the potential to generate employment the msme sector is poised for a rapid growth and integration with major global value chains Realizing, realizing the importance of the MSME, the government of India has increased the criteria of increased investments and turnover recently, so that more MSMEs can take advantage of the special loans by the government to these companies to tide over the COVID lockdown, and also special interest reduction of five percent to bring down the cost of operation. This will aid the MSME companies to grow. Even during the COVID, the MSME platform of the Bombay Stock Exchange or the BSC has been able to raise a couple of thousand crores. Uh, in through stock market to grow as the government's vision is the msme should contribute to 60% of the country export 50% of the gdp and additional employment of 50 million people in 5 years in germany 99% of the companies are msme and are known as mittelstand and in austria and switzerland are around 95% are msmes reviving of the uh, demand the reviving of the demand post covid is the most important to see that the demand comes back to normal see as india 70% of most population live in villages and smaller towns and the government has come out with various financial help to these families in various forms and will have boosted up the demand in bigger cities the shops malls offices are still open up and this will big back bring back the employment and also the demand for goods and services the exports have started and this is helping the factories to increase production as the indian economy the 55% is service sector 22% manufacturing 18% agriculture this year we had a good growth in agriculture and next year also is predicted that it is going to be very good and the demand will be also good in addition india's cost advantage comes alongside its democratic leadership with a emphasis on transparency and rules rule based international order further the government has initiated various policies for boosting demand in the rural areas by carrying out reforms in the agriculture sector and providing employment and opportunities and integrating in various programs i think agriculture is and uh, processing industries in agriculture is going to be the next big thing in india these steps will help boost uh, short to medium term demand thank you thank you very much manoj that was very interesting and uh, i can see you know i think that india probably has a lot to teach the world in terms of SMEs are such an important part of the Indian economy and you're right with your urban development activities in the middle of that and so maybe that's a good transition of uh, for us to go over to ask Balaji uh Balaji welcome can you uh, introduce yourself and your uh, who are you where are you and your 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 perch in the tree and then give your thoughts on it uh, hi john hi frank thanks a lot I think this is one of the first time that I'm going to speak after dinner, and I think everybody is going to listen around the same time. So this is very interesting. Uh, I'm the founder of Great16.com. We create digital platform for worksheets and workbooks for primary schools. <clears throat> I think we are one of the few sector which actually got benefited with this COVID crisis because prior to this, nobody wanted to get into digital beyond a point. now there is sudden demand and suddenly from the march 2020 you know there's been schools and teachers and parents from all over the world trying to reach us and trying to get our resources having said that <clears throat> there are a couple of points that i would like to uh, mention here uh, the education industry globally has been affected big time especially in schools we do not know when the schools are going to start on this september october we don't know what has happened in this bargain is uh, the schools you know the private schools especially are in tremendous pressure to generate funds for them to run the operation the parents do not are not really willing to pay the school fees too and the not many resources that are available for students especially in india and probably in many countries in the world digital resources nobody was prepared for this so this has brought the whole education industry into a big problem and probably an advantage to the edtech leaders who are probably leading the world right now it's a good thing uh, i think somewhere going further things have to change 
and we're looking for some positive uh, decisions from government across the world uh, in terms of ed tech policies and um, ensuring that all the online education is properly recognized and the government supports everywhere. Uh, with these points, I think I would like to leave it to the group to take it to the next step. Okay, great, great. Thanks. That's an important topic. And um, we have two, if not three, uh, experts in education <clears throat> here with us today. Shiv, uh, Kara, you're the next on my, my hit list. Uh, okay. Can you uh, introduce yourself? I know you're an esteemed uh, source of wisdom across India, and uh, we're delighted to have your, your comments today. Can you? Introduce yourself and your what you're doing, your company, and then give some comments about the, the roadmap for India's transition. Okay, thank you, John. Well, I come from a business family. We had coal mines in India, and the government nationalized, so we came on the street. So I left India 45 years ago, went to U.S., initially went to Toronto. Since I'm not that educated, I'm a become third of the end. So I started life with a bucket in my hand, washing car for two years, door to door. And gradually, I was selling vacuum cleaners in the evening and then got into selling life insurance totally by accident. God was kind, moved on to the U.S., eventually got into three businesses. I bought out a company out of California in 1984 and started the New Jersey operation with no clients. I sold my company close to 500 dollars Now, that is my background here. Now, coming back, I've been involved in two, the learning and development for the past... Uh, 30 odd years, and do, I do corporate training, leadership training with many Fortune 100 companies. But for the last five years, something has very changed drastically in my life, and that is that when I do corporate training, <clears throat> I tell my clients and I tell everybody there today that what I am doing here in your corporation is repair work. I am repairing. Now, if you prepare them, you won't have to repair them. Now, where do you prepare them? You prepare them in schools and colleges. Obviously, they haven't done the job right. So we created a whole program called Prepare, Don't Repair. And uh, for postgraduates, we created a program to create leaders who can manage, not managers who cannot lead. I repeat, to create leaders who can manage, not managers who cannot lead. And because... Today, all over the world, this is global. People are finding very difficult to get good people to work. Very difficult to find good people. That you can ask the panelists. And uh, therefore, we created a whole program and we're creating one for schools online. And we just partnered with James Cook University from Australia, the Singapore campus, to start out a leadership program for them. But the most important thing is that uh, uh, Mercedes with my client, there's a senior executive wrote an article that things are changing so fast that products are getting obsolete the day they're getting launched. I repeat, products are getting obsolete the day they're getting launched. And mm. knowledge is getting obsolete within two to three years. Mm. Engineering graduates, by the time they get to the fourth year, what they learned the first, it became obsolete. Medical graduates, by the time they get to the fourth and the fifth year, what they learn the first became obsolete. Now, with that scenario, either we are in deep trouble or there's a great opportunity for those who are prepared. But when we talk of preparation, what do you prepare for when you don't even know what's coming? When we don't know what's coming, how do we prepare for the unknown? So here is something happened and which has literally changed my life. And that is... I started penning down an article because everybody says the only constant is change. Only constant is change. So I started penning down an article. Is there anything else in this world that is constant? And my answer was, and there are three things that are constant. And they are one. And if we master the constants, it doesn't matter what comes in the future, no matter what. We can face every technology change, no matter what. And what are the constants in life? The three things. One. People skills, two, persuasion skills, three, prioritizing skills. What was, the third, what was the third one, number three? Prioritizing skills. Three, 
They have never changed. They will never change. Go check our parents, their parents, their parents. All over the world, all over the world. We are, we are hired for our skills, but we are fired for our behavior, yes, no. And two, all over the world, we don't have business problems, we have people problems. And when we take care of our people problems, most of our business problems are automatically resolved. So this is where I put my trust and came back. And the other day, a uh, school principal hosted our webinar with 22,000 principals all over the world. And the biggest thing, they said, what kind of do we need in our schools and colleges? And my biggest thing was emotional intelligence, EQ, which is worth more than IQ. And there are two things that are crucial. And they are, one is attitude and two, values. Go check out I've, all the top executives all over the world. You ask them one thing. If there was one thing you would like to see change in your organization that would make you more productive, what would it be? And everybody said attitude. If our people had a better, better attitude, with a better teamwork, better quality, everything would go up. And that is where I looked at the education system in Denmark, in Japan, and there they stress a lot on people development. And now when you talk of India, when we talk of India, see, one thing I'm convinced, how do we measure progress in a country? It is not by the industry or infrastructure. It is by the quality of the character the country is producing of its people. And sadly, we're not. And that is one major thing that I'm looking at. And number two, number two is the major, major challenges taking place in India. And the second biggest challenge we are facing is population explosion. Now you have population explosion. You see, 1952, India had a family planning program, which failed. Now, where that Hong Kong had a two-child policy. Iran had a two-child policy. In England, so came up with a report that we should not give any more benefits to people having more than two kids. See, India has to, the crime situation, education, shortage of supplies, the healthcare problem, Everything related to population. Are you aware that India has 55 children being born per minute? China has 11 children being born per minute. So whatever we are talking gets negated five minutes later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it comes back to unless we address the core, we will keep addressing the symptoms for the rest of our lives and it will never work then. So I've just learned one thing in my life that look, Bottom line is more important than top line to hell with top line. I don't care. We need to address the core issues. Rest will take care of itself. And mm. that's the way it is. The bottom line and the three things are people skills, persuasion skills, and prioritizing skills. Go check it out all over the world. The lower a person is in life, just let me know if the time is over, John. The lower a person is in life, 90% of the time goes to is less than 10% people. And higher you go up, it just reverses. And that's true all over the world. Mm -hmm. So that is where my trust is. That is what I would look at for India. If India has to move forward, we have to address all the way, right from the top to the bottom. Otherwise, we will keep talking, having programs like this every year, and every year we keep hearing new stuff, and in the same place. And that's about it. I'll stop right. Thank you very, very much. I was very take, taken by what you said on Friday when we had our our, 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 our and you said you talked about some of these um, initiatives, and you said you're really uh, focusing on training people's character rather than uh, skills, technical skills, because that's that's what drives uh, humanity. And, um, you know, the U.S. rose currently to its position in the world uh, over 100, you know, 100 years ago, 75 years ago, partly because of its moral leadership at a time of World War One and World War Two. But that doesn't seem to be there anymore, if I may say so, coming from Chicago myself, Chicago, Milwaukee. So yeah. what the world needs is better character, better morals, I think. And I, I, I'd love to introduce you to the president of Thunderbird School of Global Management in Arizona, where I went.
where he's, oh, an, Indian, he's yeah. an Indian guy. His name is Senji Pagram. And okay. uh, uh, that, that, it's all about leadership. It's it's a it's a business school, but it's all about leadership. Yeah. Global, global, global leadership. So we can follow up on that. But I'd like to segue from that over to uh, our next uh, uh, panelist, Julius Amrit. So you're, I guess, somehow involved in technology and space and um, science and technology. And uh, and uh, I don't know where morals fit in all that, but you must have them because you're doing what you're doing. Can you introduce yourself and your where you are, what you do, and your company, and offer your comments about the, the roadmap for India's transition, please? Sure. But, uh, yeah, thank you, John. I am getting this message about uh, network unstable, so in case you can't hear me, let me know. Um, so my background uh, is uh, a combination of engineering and uh, uh, management. Uh, I have been involved. Uh, I set up a space uh, company about uh, 2011 as part of a, yeah in 2011 as part of the world's largest competition ever called the Google Lunar X Prize and the competition was actually to take a rover to the moon surface, uh, make it travel for 500 meters and send back high definition signals from there. And, uh, you know, there were 43 companies, the Google sponsored event managed by XPRIZE Foundation in the US. And uh, there was no company, uh, no team in India. So a group of our friends, we got together and we said that, you know, let's take this challenge up and see what we can do about this. So for the first three years, nobody believed that, you know, we were actually trying to do this and very loud <laughs> industrialist actually said that you know it is very simple you know indians are very good in software and simulation is an easy game and then we, when we told him that you know this is real uh, he was quite taken up. but anyway long story short uh, we, we were on the top five we won about won a million dollar uh, as part of uh, of our landing uh, of our lunar lander and towards the end, Google uh, lost its patience because I think they were trying to disrupt the industry by saying that, can you build a lander in a very short time frame? And that time frame was something that initially they had thought would be about seven years and that got extended um, three times. And then finally they said that, you know, they will pull the plug. So, but at the same time, I think we managed to set up one of the most uh, innovative engineering companies uh, in the country. Aerospace is a culmination of all technologies, right? uh, material science, physics, thermal, all of it uh, put together. And uh, we then we decided that it's important for us to look at the ecosystem and see what we can do for the country. And uh, that's where we, uh, we picked up a product. It's called uh, a high altitude pseudo satellite. So it's a solar powered aircraft. And it can uh, and it travel up to 20 kilometers above the weather and send down high definition signal and basically, uh, you know, work as a satellite from the, from the skies. And it can stay there for months. So we started on this project. And uh, interestingly, you know, the first, uh, uh, I would say, party or entity that really got interested was the Indian Defense uh, uh, MOD got interested in this because uh, you know in India, ISRO is mandated mostly for civilian applications. Who 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 got invest, involved in it? Uh, Ministry of Defense MOD, Indian MOD. Okay, okay, yeah. So via one of their uh, agencies. So ISRO is mandated to you know build satellites and the space anything above uh, you know the horizon line is basically considered to be space and there is this whole area of near space uh, which is very interesting as far as science uh, and technology is concerned and we are building this product now what's important about this is not not the platform per se but the <clears> fact <throat> that this is happening out of country the fact that you know uh, one of the largest spender of indian r d which is drdo does not have a program in this area uh, the fact that uh, National Aerospace Labs, some of the largest mandated agencies in the country, has not really done this, but there is a private party that is trying to do this. And this is where you know 
uh, ultimately, I think uh, I would like to dovetail this into what I think is the roadmap. You know, and the roadmap is that you know we keep talking about brain drain and why Facebook has not come out of India and you know why Google there is no Google in India, etc. The challenge today is that if you look at Facebook, if you look at Google, if you look at large pharma companies, the technology that they use ultimately that was invested by the U.S. government. So it is the government which is building the technology, and it is the private enterprise which is actually able to take this tech and and you know create a very large impact. Ninety percent of technology in Google was eventually funded by you know by the U.S. government, whether it was NASA or uh, you know AFRL and the likes, and if you were to look at it from what is really happening in India, you know we have two very large agencies, uh, like the Department of Science and Technology and the Defense Research and Development Organization, which carry the bulk of the budget for R and D in the country. And the interface with the private enterprise to unlock and realize these technologies and let next generation technology come forward is important. So. In a very, very large sense, it is the investment. And there is a direct correlation between development of any country worldwide and, and the investment in science and technology. And this is known. I mean, this is not new. I mean, this is on for decades now. And the best example and unfortunate example of what we really see happening is what is happening in China today. You know, we can crib as much as we want. But the amount of money that has gone down into investment in science and technology and education in science and technology in China is unparalleled as a percentage of GDP and in absolute sense. So where I'm coming from is saying that you know, there is there has been a very large thrust towards startup India, um, which has galvanized the youth to look at an alternate form of building careers and, and business. Uh, that has to now work with budgets of the government, and it is it is important. That there, and there are a lot of models worldwide. Whether it's Israel, uh, you know, which has been very successful in doing this, and uh, you know, the U.S. of course, very large funding available. Uh, but the but the Indian government is the largest spender as far as you know R and D in science and technology is concerned. You know, and why is that money and that that are indeed not really reflecting on the ground in terms of solutions. Why do we have to, you know, import uh, ventilator technology from now? And why do we have to, you know, find solutions for environment and irrigation, you know, from outside? And it is all it is all happening, and these are elements and pockets of these things all around. Okay. So I think what's the point that I'm trying to make here is that Indians, you know, the DNA is entrepreneurial. You know, there. We produce the world's largest number of science, you know, engineers and doctors in the world. Uh, we have the money to do it. You know. There is a requirement to be able to build policies around how startups can participate with the government and how they can get involved and engaged in actually creating enterprise. At, and, and this is not about leadership. There is enough. I mean, the same leaders who are now you know running fortune 100 companies right now are all indians you know and that kind of talent and technology is available here the issue is that the policy and the glass ceilings don't allow these individuals to come out and create impact and this is a fundamental as so uh, without mentioning so um, so if i were to summarize this i'm essentially saying you know way that India can transform and transition out of this whole place is the right use of technology, investment in science and technology. And the way that this can move forward is that the government has to play a very active role in ensuring that the large enterprises created by the government is able to interact with the startups and leverage the funding and the capital investment done by these companies. I would love to follow up on that with you a little bit more uh, offline. I, I I came to India about eight years ago to found an accelerator in Bangalore, and I wound up in investing with some friends several million dollars into startups, Indian startups, and I'm still on their boards. 
and uh, it's a different, it's a difficult challenge to build an ecosystem to get the, the money and the talent and the opportunity all together. But uh, it's it's really the way of the future. But we have about ten minutes left, and I want to get uh, uh, Rajiv to come in for five minutes and Nitin to come in for five minutes. Rajiv, can you uh, go next, please? Uh, introduce yourself and what you're doing and your perspectives on on uh, the roadmap for India's transition. Sure thing, John. Thank you. And uh, after uh, Sam, Manoj, Balaji, Shiv, uh, Julius, etc., I think I, I could get done in about uh, 30 seconds flat because there's no. hardly any left uh, for me to speak on. Uh, once again, my name is Rajiv Ahuja. I represent a company known as StarTech. I'm, a, I'm the president. Uh, we are an American corporation. This one is a stock exchange. Uh, present across 13 different countries, uh, employing about 45,000 people, and a significant amount of that workforce resides in India. So, uh, so apart, apart from the fact that, of course, I am Indian, uh, you know, the fact that India roadmap, what will the transition look like? What will, will we need to do to be able to move to the next level? Is something that uh, that has always been very dear to my heart. Uh, so I will not repeat uh, all that has already been said. Uh, I think the uh, two broad points that I would like to make in addition to whatever has been said by my fellow panelists is, firstly, let's talk about where are we today. I mean, COVID is the is the uh, buzzword, and uh, you know, it's it's paralyzed countries, it's paralyzed uh, governments, it's paralyzed economies, it's paralyzed life to a very large extent. Uh, and the same holds true for, uh, you know, life in India. I just think we need a centralized noble agency on the lines of FEMA, which supersedes uh, 29 states, seven union territories, pulling and pushing in different directions to be able to take care of such a, today it is a pandemic, tomorrow it could be an epidemic, it could be, uh, you know, who knows what comes next. But, uh, but so you mean you mean something that's like a new world a government in a way? No, a, a, a slightly different way of governing. Our governance model has to change, and, I, and I'm going to dwell on that for a moment or two more. Uh, the headline here being our politics needs to, needs to get better. Today, our politics has a direct impact on national security. I think Sam touched on that. Uh, public policy, a number of the other speakers uh, spoke on that, which in turn goes on to impact how the common man leads his life. And the quality of how we run our entire political system, I think, is being totally misused on the lines of the fact that we are the world's largest democracy. In fact, in my opinion, and this is a personal opinion, our democracy is probably our biggest impediment to progress. Our and I'll give you one very quick, very small, granular example, John. I mean, my, the rest of my fellow panelists will be able to relate to it very easily. But let's assume there is one of uh, Delhi, New Delhi's busiest uh, traffic crossing points, where there are about a hundred thousand cars that have to idle and cross, and uh, and and you know uh, the authorities decide that they will build. A, uh, a flyover there so that it could reduce the commute time, it could reduce the idle time and in turn reduce the kind of fuel that we burn. And then somebody goes and files a case in the courts and the courts then take seven to ten years to decide the case. I mean, look at the millions that suffer on account of us being a democracy. So while I pride myself in the fact that we, I am a part of the world's largest democracy, but I do think uh, that democracy is being misused also. So we need to change our governance model. That's point number one. Then the other uh, thing that's really close to my heart, and I think will, which it will play a very important part in how our future uh, will look and, uh, and how we define the future is, is how do we go about building capacity? Capacity when it comes to infrastructure and capacity when it comes to skill developing, because the world that we live in today is going to look very different a few quarters or say a few years from now. Are we ready 
to take on that new world which and i think that was a point that uh, you know shiv was trying to drive home on skill building etc and i think we've got to get far far better at it so uh, that's where i'll, I'll you know i leave it uh, you know you promised me five and i'm giving it back to you john so that uh, the last speaker can get his share of uh, air time great thank you very very thoughtful comments uh, i'm completely with you uh, that's 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 a good so nitin uh, we're running at the end of the line uh, left not me can you uh, introduce yourself and what you're doing at Merlin Group and uh, offer your comments on the roadmap, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John and Frank and every all the panelists. It was a great inside hearing everything. I'm Nitin Datta. I, I am at the Merlin Group. It's London-based. We are a manufacturing facility and we do consultancy. And we are manufacturers-based and hardcore manufacturing means we do we don't outsource the manufacturing. We are manufacturers ourselves. That's why we give consultants in manufacturing to move ahead in the roadmap. And which and we our specialization is into defense, food processing, and we do a lot of work in in aerospace. And that's our bread and butter. And mostly defense work is our hardcore business. Uh, in that case, we do a lot of reporting as well, which 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 involves a lot of procedures and it's a very precisionate manufacturing. So importing is also always in a precision manufacturing, it has to be very, very, very precise. So we have expertise in doing that as well, getting robot operations done, then delivered and tested. And those things are basically used uh, in all the electronic systems, which can be uh, traffic management systems to all medical systems, uh, for which R&D is done in Europe and manufacturing is done in Far East, which includes India and China at primarily safe. India 80%, China 20%. Uh, that's my history. So it's a great insight heading to all the panels. Uh, let me jump in. Let me jump in quick. I see a notice on my screen here that says okay. we have 10 seconds left. I don't know if we're going to get cut off. I, yeah. I, or, or we're going to continue. Four seconds. Three seconds. Yeah. It may. It might end. The world may come to an end. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we, we, are... we can keep on talking. All right. Okay. So. Uh, well, we can talk about ourselves and uh, we can just talk and summarize the topic. I'm sure it's going to go ahead. Uh, I think the only idea is the thought should go ahead. So I will not take too long. So that is my history. So I think the roadmap of India's transition, as we discussed, uh, John, and my basic contribution, which I have expertise, is in FDI, foreign direct investment and mergers and acquisitions, uh, which I've been doing for the last uh, 12 years. So my my point of view is you know covid after covid transitions have changed so i believe in positivity rather than coming about the situation and finding solutions because i am responsible for people personally who think i should be responsible for them that has given me more thought and insight to get into this pandemic situation as well and keep the houses moving although there's all of government support as well in that so what I feel is, in COVID, we have learned new learnings how to move ahead. So with regards to India, what I think is already, I mean, we don't talk about this, but already huge corporates are playing their role. What is happening is they are helping, uh, like like uh, like Manoj said, MSA, MSME and SMEs need survival money. So all the big corporates, if you think, they have a policy at the moment, due to, not due to governmental pressure, on their own, because they say, and I, because we work directly with all the business houses as a consultant, as a consulting, you know, getting things moving on the ground. So my point is very simple. It's a big corporate. Let the MSME and SME survival there. Because in this pandemic, there is a no possibility that nobody can survive alone. So we all have to survive. So the let's put it like this. So the bigger corporates are putting, putting, giving orders, letting the ecosystem move in this pandemic as well and this is this is a very positive thing for india i mean i i'm i'll just concerned about the positive things and the way moving ahead so obviously msme and sme are getting survival from huge corporates and we have heard the talks as well and systems and ecosystems are moving even in this scenario technology and ai digital is a new normal which of course everybody know and due to if you think about positivity and foreign direct investment the biggest company in India got the biggest funds in the world when everything was under lockdown. 
and this is no hidden fact during the lockdown a huge humongous amounts of money were raised and one of the biggest corporates in india has one venture which they can see we are in a debt free platform of course the works must have been going on for the last uh, many years but you know conclusion happened this lockdown and imagine nobody flew out of the country to deal with the scenario everything was done so more digital technology is being used to close deals which were un- unable thought that we need a boardroom meeting so we don't need a boardroom meeting now that's a new learning and we are moving ahead so survival can covid can has to be done together not alone so that is a new learning then that is a way ahead so i mean if we think about covid we will say it has been stopped and stuff so i would like to touch a few sectors which 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 i think they have grown or grown more agriculture so agriculture is one thing which has not been affected by covid all throughout the world agriculture has remained constant even gone better in some areas and we are not talking only india we are talking everywhere in the world and india has taken a lead so agriculture pharma of course we all know defense and that is a very 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 sensitive sector in the world this time but defense because i am in defense so i can proudly say you that defense has not been affected at all and so has been aerospace i'm sure julius will agree on that because he will have a bit of more insight and food and food processing industries have not been affected so basically industries which have been affected which has of course as a traffic traffic jam effect you know one car has stopped so you know 10 cars behind that has stopped but industries which are basic are running i mean that's the new normal moving forward yes but what i want to say is the road ahead only lies in moving together so in so when i when somebody comes when a corporate comes and asks me why do you want to invest in india that you know we have lots of problems political political lot of political issues lot of geographical issues sometimes and you know i even find myself there are a lot of logistical issues so one thing which needs in the india transition is logistics should be improved we talk about this a lot we have been talking about this a lot for last 20 years but it's coming it's coming to a point that they are moving but not at that pace like other countries have the logistics there in simple so if you manufacture things in india it's very difficult to move those things out of india so that should be improved that's another way forward thing i would like to say and suggest and we all and they are still moving so logistics should be improved moreover the thing is that people want to invest in india and corporates want to invest in india any stock exchange company in us because i'm sure you know a lot of you you will be knowing a lot of companies they want to come to india and one on one discussion with them is you know we have the huge consumer base we have the largest population in the world which is a young population which uses technologies as you know as everybody has said you know they are the most educated technological people are available in india that's why every company wants to invest in india i'm sure it's difficult paradigm shift people moving ahead but if we take this people as for an advantage i think india will awake and arise more than other democracies in the world and other countries in the world this is this is my only short summary i would like to say for the road ahead thank you very much uh, nitin um i agree with you uh lots of interesting uh learnings have come through this everybody from a different perspective education technology fdi um uh, sme on this on this panel i wish we had another 2 hours to actually exchange uh your points and uh and learn from each other and maybe meet up and do business i hope we can all um learn from this i hope we all meet at the next rss india meeting uh i'm going to keep everybody's name in my in my database and i'm going to look you up and uh i definitely want to follow up with you uh, on different uh, different topics here thank you so much we're out of time thank you for contributing to the rss Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I I I don't mind if you want to share my details or contact details, my phone number, email with the other family. And if they don't mind, uh, could you share that with me, including yours? Okay. I'll thank circulate you. among everybody. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and a special thank you to Frank uh, Richter for having um, gone through the hard work of. Uh, of uh, creating this digital platform. I think it's got a great future, and. and it's going to help the world thank you thank you everybody thank you, thank you. all of you take care bye bye